All right, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, everybody. This is Dr. B, and I'm here to talk to you about Chapter 7. Uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about in Modules 9 and 10. And so we're going to get to it. Uh, but first, take a look at my science shirt. I've got my little mole here. And he's in, oh, I just disappeared. Sorry about that. It's a thousand milliliters, which of course is one liter. And uh, so that's one mole per liter. I know it's chemistry again. I know I've just got a lot of chemistry shirts. So uh, remember, all chemistry is based on physics. So let's get to it. All right, you should now be able to see my screen, which is, uh, Showing you a little guy here. And let's see. Oh, there we go. Get him into motion. And you can see that little guy doing work. And then over here in this one, uh, you can see somebody doing some work on the book. And when they're doing work on the book, uh, they are changing some chemical energy from their food into uh, gravitational potential energy. So we're gonna be talking about both of those things more. Uh, and you can just ignore that day 17, I meant to delete that. All right, so things to know about this chapter. And this sounds stupid, but it's one of those things where it clicks at some point, but it's not gonna click on its own. You have to work at it. So it's a different way of thinking about things and it takes some practice, okay? You've gotta put in the time. Um, but there's really a, a beautiful simplicity to it. So I hope that you get to that point where you see like, oh my gosh, this makes things so much easier to analyze. Um, and if, if you get to that point, you're really gonna love it. Slide 17 um, has some, some good keys here and I'll, I'll make sure I point that out when we get to it because that, that really helps to uh, be able to determine if an object has each of the three kinds of energy that we're gonna be looking at in this chapter. All right, so what is energy? Capacity to do work, source of usable power. Neither of those are particularly helpful. So, uh, well, how are we gonna deal with it if we don't have a good definition? Well, I don't have a better one, but I think we have an idea of what energy is. And the more we talk about it, the better the sense you'll get of what energy is and how it relates to work, how it's different than force and so on. So there's lots of different kinds of energy, chemical and thermal, mechanical, electromagnetic, nuclear, et cetera. We're gonna really focus just on mechanical energy. And in particular, uh, we're going to look at two kinds of energy in there. Well, two, but then we're gonna break one of them into, into parts. So kinetic and potential, and we're gonna look at two kinds of potential energy within mechanical. All right. so. Kinetic energy, you may remember this from middle school or elementary school, good chance you had it before, is energy of motion and potential energy is stored energy. Um, now there's lots of other ways to store energy than through mechanical means. You can store energy, uh, for example, through chemical means or electrical means, but we're really, again, just looking at mechanical energy. And so the two ways we can store mechanical energy uh, that we're going to talk about in this chapter anyway, are through gravity and through a spring, okay? By raising something up higher in a gravitational field or by compressing or stretching a spring from its standard or uh, relaxed length. So examples of kinetic energy, a moving car, a ball that is falling through the air or falling without any air. Uh, potential energy, like I said, a compressed spring, car at the top of a hill, Remember, it could also be a stretched spring that works just as well. All right, uh, we're gonna I'm gonna show you a uh, skateboarding demonstration uh, with, with a simulation, actually. Um, if we were in class, I'd show you my bowling ball demonstration. Uh, you can certainly look up YouTube videos of somebody pulling a bowling ball back to their nose, letting it go, and it swings out, it's on a pendulum, and it swings back to their nose. All right, you should be able to see a little skateboarder here. And I pick up the skateboarder and I add energy into the system. I did work on the skateboarder. You can see 
on my graph over here, the amount of potential energy has increased. And now I'm going to let go of the skateboarder. And she's going to go back and forth. And the amount of kinetic and potential energy is changing. But notice how the total amount of energy is not changing. Okay, Total amount's not changing. It's just changing back and forth from kinetic to potential. And note that the potential energy never goes to zero. At the bottom, potential energy is not zero. Why is that? Well, this is something we'll get into more later. But while I have this, I figured I might as well show you. Potential energy, well, gravitational potential energy is measured relative to some reference height. So let's see the reference height. I'm going to click this box. Now we can see the reference height is the ground. And that's a pretty common thing for people to use, uh, for students and other people to use, is to just use the ground. But we don't have to. We could, we could make the reference height the lowest point in the system or somewhere else. But the ground and then this lowest point are, are common places. So if we put that right there, and then we continue the simulation, now we can see that the kinetic and potential go back and forth. And the potential energy does go, oh, I just missed it again, but it does go to zero when she's at the bottom. Okay. So she has mechanical energy. The total amount of mechanical energy is staying constant. The amount of kinetic mechanical energy is increasing and decreasing. And this is based on how fast she's going. And then the potential, gravitational potential energy is changing and that's based on how high she is relative to this line and that's arbitrary we can pick it to be wherever we want to be we just want to keep it the same as we do an analysis and then for the next analysis we could change it to something else all right well, that's all i wanted to show you on that now back to here and we'll we will come back to that uh, skateboarding demo in a little bit so there's this principle um or law called the law of conservation of energy. I'm not talking about turning off the lights when you leave the room, though that's good too. I'm talking about the total amount of energy in the universe staying the same. So EI equals EF for the whole universe. All right, well, that's great. Um, nobody's ever proven this to be wrong. And so we believe it, but it's not particularly useful because we can't go around adding up all the energy in the whole universe and getting anything useful out of it. So let's look at, well, I actually didn't show you this pendulum demonstration, um, but you can imagine if I had a pendulum and then I pushed on it, that way, then it would swing higher. And so I can change the amount of energy. Well, I'm not changing the amount of energy in, this, in the universe. I'm just changing the amount of energy in the system of the pendulum. So this, conservation of, of energy, law of conservation of energy applies to the whole universe. But what if we want to apply it just to a system? Then we need to change this a little bit to be able to analyze just a system. So we're going to write the equation like this. The energy of the system plus the amount of work done on the system by non-conservative forces, we'll get to what those are later, is equal to the final energy. And this is just an accounting equation. We've done this before. The velocity initial, v naught x, plus the change represented by ax times t is equal to vx. Initial velocity plus the change equals final velocity. So we've already been doing some accounting uh, just like this, but for velocity. Now this one is for energy. Energy and work must have the same units, and the SI unit of work and energy is the joule. And it's equal to a Newton meter. All right. So what is work? It's force exerted over a distance. And we have an equation for it. This is a capital W. It's a little bit hard to tell for this one, uh, but it is a capital W. And I will, if I'm handwriting them, I put little bars here, just little horizontal lines on the, the tops to designate it as a capital, just for my handwritten work on the board or in my notes. And it's equal to the magnitude of the force vector. Okay, this is the vector form of the force here. This is the magnitude of it. So it's not going to be negative, just the magnitude. And then D is the magnitude of the displacement. And the displacement vector is designated by D with the arrow over it. And then also 
Notice that we used delta x and delta y for displacement previously, but now we're just generically using d with the vector hat to represent the displacement in some direction. Doesn't matter what direction, um, could be horizontal, vertical, diagonal, whatever. We're just going to call it d for this chapter. And then theta is the angle between these two vectors. Okay. So magnitude of the first vector, magnitude of the second vector, and then the angle between them, or the cosine of the angle between them. All right, so that's how we calculate work. Here is a figure from your book. And you can see somebody mowing the lawn. They're pushing um, in this direction. Although when I mow the lawn, I don't actually push in that direction, but you could. Uh, so he's pushing parallel to the handle. I guess you could call it, and the mower is moving that way. And so the work is equal to this force, the, ma the magnitude of this force times the magnitude of how far he pushes it times the cosine of whatever this angle is. Uh, here's somebody carrying a briefcase. So he's pulling up on the briefcase and he's going forward at constant speed and he goes some distance D. So the angle here, between F and D, that's a 90 degree angle, cosine of 90 is zero. So no matter how far he carries the briefcase, he does zero work on it. Hmm. All right, uh, let's see. Here's another example. This is a briefcase being lowered down. Okay, I guess these are stairs. And so the briefcase is being lowered down. So this is the direction of the displacement. This is the direction of the force. Okay, so yes, the force is that direction, the tension, okay? And they've just called it F here generically, um, but that is a tension force. So the amount of work done by the tension would be the size of this tension times the size of this displacement times the cosine of what angle? Well, the angle between these two vectors, they're pointing 180 degrees apart from each other. So cosine of 180, that's negative one. So the tension, in the cable is doing negative work on the suitcase or briefcase. All right, so those are just a few examples. Let's keep going. And we just talked about this a little bit. Uh, so work can be positive if the force or just any component of it is in the same direction as the displacement. And this causes the amount of energy in the system to increase. Just remember our accounting equation. Or is it, there it is, our accounting equation. If we have a certain amount of energy and then we have positive work, that increases the amount of energy in the system. So our final amount is going to be greater. Likewise, if this is negative, then that's going to decrease the energy in the system. All right, negative work. If the force or some component of the force is in the opposite direction of the displacement, as was the case with that cable here on this slide, then the work is going to be negative. All right, drawing a work diagram. All right, we've drawn motion diagrams, which were dots. We've drawn trajectories, which were dashed lines in a parabola or part of a parabola. We have drawn free body diagrams. Now, you are going to uh, continue drawing free body diagrams in this chapter, in, this, in modules nine and 10, but you're also going to learn how to draw a work diagram. And if you look on your equation sheet, you will see the shorthand for how to draw a work diagram. It's hidden. So what you have to do is look for the equation for work and you'll find W equals FD cosine theta. So that's the instructions on how to draw a work diagram. So you're going to draw an arrow to represent the displacement. That's the D in there. And you're going to put it in the actual direction the object moves. So don't rotate anything because you feel like it. You have to draw the arrow in the actual direction the object moves and then you're going to draw an arrow to represent the force and you're going to draw the force vector in the actual direction of the force and then and it doesn't matter which uh order you do those two things in then you're going to label the angle between those so f d theta so the equation work equals f d cosine theta the three things in there, those are the three things that go on your work diagram. You're gonna draw a work diagram for each force for which you are calculating work. And we're gonna do some examples of that.
All right, so here's an example. This is from your note packet. We have some block and it's getting, these two forces are uh, being exerted on it as well as whatever other forces you might think as it gets pulled across a rough horizontal surface. So there would be a normal force. And of course we've got this F1 and F2. The block has weight, Mg or W, and there is some friction. It said it was a rough surface and it tells us that there is some friction here. All right, so that's our free body diagram. The weight plus things it's touching, it's touching the table, which exert those two forces. And then there's these external forces from something, who knows? All right, now we're going to draw a work diagram for each of those five forces. So we'll start with, oh, I don't know. We'll start with F1. So the work diagram, we draw the displacement, we draw the force, and we label the angle between them, which is 30 degrees. And so the work, equal to 100 newtons times 30 meters times the cosine of 30 degrees. 100 times 30 cosine of 30 is 2,598 newton meters, which is a joule, capital J for joule. All right, F2. D is in this direction. F2 is in this direction. So what's the angle between those two? Angle is zero degrees. So W equals 200 newtons times 30 meters times the cosine of zero degrees. Cosine of zero, anybody know what that is? It's one. So it's just 200 times 30. So that's 6,000 joules. All right, what else? We got the weight or mg, so weight is acting down, okay? Lowercase w, lowercase w, displacement's this way, the angle is 90 degrees, so the work, capital W, and I guess I could put subscripts on these, w sub f1, w sub f2, w sub w equals, let's see, I don't know what the weight is, let's just leave it blank, times 30 meters times the cosine of 90 degrees. Cosine of 90 is zero. So this is gonna be zero joules. The, the weight does no work whatsoever. Normal force up, displacement this way, 90 degree angle. Work done by the normal force is equal to zero because theta equals 90 degrees. Okay, so I didn't write out the whole thing, but I told you exactly what I was thinking, so you can follow what I'm doing. That's good for you all to do as well. All right, what else? We got one more. Friction, kinetic friction. That's kinetic friction acting in that direction. Displacement still this way. What's the angle there? 180 degrees. So the work done by kinetic friction is equal to 50 newtons times 30 meters. Remember, not, not negative, okay? It's not negative 50. You're like, oh, but it's to the left. No, because this is the magnitude of the force, the magnitude of the displacement, and then the angle between them. If there's any negative signs that need to come into play, it'll come into play because of the cosine of the angle. And in fact, cosine of 180, as we talked about fairly recently, is negative one. So 50 times 30, uh, 1500, Joules times negative one. So that's a negative sign there. Okay, and if we need to, like I think in your packet, to find the total work done, we can add these up. Okay, that's just simple arithmetic there. I'll let you do those on your own. All right, let's do another example. We have a skier being pulled up a ramp at a slope of 30 degrees, okay, so every little skier guy is there. And then later, 
he's up there. Okay, so he got pulled up the hill. So what forces are acting on him? Well, he's getting pulled up by a rope. So there's tension in the rope. Normal force acts perpendicular to the hill. Okay, so this dashed line is going to be both my x-axis and it is the same slope as the hill. It's my y-axis. We have weight, lowercase w right there. And then let's see, is there going to be friction? Yes, there is friction in this one. So F, K. I'm not going to calculate the work by all of the forces. I'm just going to do one of them here. Uh, but there is another video that shows you um, how to do the other ones. Let's just look at the tension, the work diagram. What direction does he go? Where's his displacement? Well, he starts here and he goes that way. So he moves diagonally. What direction was the tension pulling on him? That way. Okay. So what's the angle there? Theta equals zero degrees. So when you go to calculate the work, capital W, it's equal to the tension. Well, here, actually, I know the number. 280 newtons times 30. Uh, how far does he go? 50 meters. Sorry about that. 50 meters is the magnitude of the displacement times the cosine of zero degrees. Okay, people see 30 and they want to put 30 in for theta no matter what. But you have to think about it. That's what the work diagram is supposed to do. It's supposed to make you think about what's going on there to draw the displacement, draw the force vector, which I forgot to label here, and to figure out what the angle is between them. Okay, not every angle uh, in these calculations of our work, and there's a table in your packet, um, in your note packet that will take you through the other ones for normal force, weight, and friction. Um, and actually, none of them are 30 degrees uh, when you go to put in that value there. So I hope that helps. And we're going to pause and, and go back to the PowerPoint. All right, energy quiz one. What has more energy, a baseball moving towards you at five miles per hour or 100 miles per hour? And you can think about all of these in terms of pain, hypothetical pain, hopefully. Um, certainly the 100 mile per hour baseball would hurt more than the five mile per hour one. Uh, what about a dump truck or a baseball, both moving at five miles per hour? I would not want to be in front of the dump truck if I had the choice between the two. What about a baseball moving towards you at 100 miles per hour or a dump truck moving towards you at one mile per hour? Okay, and you're not allowed to move out of the way of either of them. Um, that's a tough one because one of them has more speed and one of them has more mass. So it's a tough call. But to really answer that last one, we're going to need an equation. We're, of course, talking about kinetic energy, energy of motion. And the equation is 1 half mv squared. And so if we had some more information for C, we could figure out which one has more energy. But for the first two, it was obvious, okay? Because one of the two factors was the same, so we only had to look at the other factor. All right, what has more energy? A brick held one foot above your head or a pebble held one foot above your head? All right, definitely a brick. All right, if you drop a brick on your head versus drop a pebble on your head, I would, I'd rather have the pebble. All right, uh, what about a brick one foot above your head or a brick 10 feet above your head? Well, definitely the one foot because the farther it falls, the faster it's gonna be going. So that brick that's 10 feet up must have more energy than the one that's only one foot up. And then similarly to the last time, here's a case where we can't figure it out because one of them has the mass advantage and one of them has the height advantage. And so you can't tell without an equation. We are here talking about gravitational potential energy and the equation for that PE sub G equals MGH, okay? This and the one for kinetic energy, those equations are both on your equation sheet. Please find them. Pause the video and do it now. All right, welcome back. Another one, ball is sitting against a spring that is not compressed or a ball sitting against a spring that is compressed. Obviously, the one that's sitting against the compressed spring has more energy. Um, there's more potential for something to happen. What if the spring is compressed two centimeters or seven centimeters? The one that's compressed more is going to have more energy. Just like a rubber band, if you pull back the rubber band a little bit, 
have a certain amount of energy, you'd be able to let go and it could fly across the room a little ways, to pull it back farther, it's gonna be able to go farther, it's gonna be able to fly farther. Um, or, or similarly, if you were snapping on somebody's arm, it would hurt more if you had pulled it back seven centimeters instead of two. All right, and then here's one where you don't have enough information. Oh wait, yes you do, because they're both three centimeters. Um, sorry about that, gotta read the thing before I go to answer it, right? Um, a weak spring or a strong spring? If you've compressed a strong spring by the same amount as a weak spring, that took more energy to get that to happen. Uh, and then you have more energy stored up in there as well. So if we we're shooting these balls out of a, uh, like a little toy cannon or a toy gun, the one with the strong spring is gonna go further. All right, so we're talking about spring energy here, which we're gonna get into more in module 10 than we do in module nine, but I like to introduce it right away. And so the equation, one half kx squared, and sometimes the x is written as delta x, okay? It's how much, e either way, either way that it's written, it's how much the spring has been stretched or compressed from its relaxed position. Because when it's relaxed, it's not storing any energy. You compress it or you stretch it, now it has energy and you let go and something's gonna happen. All right. Now, here is slide 17. This is the one I warned you about at the beginning. How to decide if an object has gravitational energy, potential uh, spring potential energy, or kinetic energy. Okay, so here are the questions you should be asking yourself so that you know if the object or system has that kind of energy. And you have to pay attention to at a particular time because you're going to have two states to worry about here. Talking about initial and final as being the states. All right, not Maryland and Virginia. Initial state, final state. Okay. So at a particular time, or at the current time, whatever it is you're looking at, is the object above the horizontal dashed line? Remember, we saw that in the skate park uh, simulation. Is the object above the horizontal dashed line that I chose to be the place where PE sub G equals zero? If it's above it, it has gravitational potential energy. If it's on it, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, and you shouldn't be below the line. That's just a kind of a bad idea. I recommend against that. All right, for spring potential energy, ask yourself at the current time, is the object sitting up against, hanging from, or attached to a spring that is compressed or stretched? If the answer is yes, it has spring potential energy. If the answer is no, it does not have spring potential energy. All right, kinetic energy. Ask yourself at the current time, is the object moving? If the answer is yes, it has kinetic energy. If the answer is no, it does not have kinetic energy. That's an easy one, but still one that people get wrong. So it's nice to have that question um, there. You can print this slide out. You can write some notes down, whatever. This will be useful as you go about doing this. And so you're gonna have to ans ask yourself and answer all three of those questions for the initial state. And then you're gonna have to ask yourself those same questions, but about the final state. But before you do that, you have to be really clear with yourself and hopefully your reader, which is most of the time going to be me, as to what exactly is your initial state and when exactly is your final state. If you're wishy-washy about that or you haven't really nailed that down, that's going to be hard on you and, uh, well, probably going to lead you to the wrong answer somewhere along the way. All right, energy bar charts. This is a way for you to show how much you understand. And so these are gonna be required as part of your assessment on note packet, homework, uh, quizzes. So be ready to be able to do these. And we've already looked at them in the simulation, the skate park simulation earlier. Well, sort of. Uh, so let's, let's look more now um, at various time periods for the skateboarder. At rest at the top of the ramp, a third of the way down, most of the way down, all the way at the bottom halfway up the other side, and then momentarily at rest at the, at the highest point at the opposite side. Okay, so I'm not gonna pull up that skate park video again, or simulation again, but you're welcome to, uh, to look that up. It's easy to find, P-H-E-T, skate park, and it, it will come right up in a Google search. All right, so at rest at the top of the ramp, 
It does not have kinetic energy because it's at rest. It's not touching a spring that has been compressed or stretched. So no spring energy. It does have some amount of gravitational potential energy. So I could have drawn a bar any size here, um, just somewhere positive. Okay. And so that's it. And so typically when we do these energy bar charts, there's going to be an initial and a final. So you're going to have three like this for initial and then three for final. In this case, we're not doing initial and final. We're doing initial, final, and then four points in the, in the middle. So it's just a more in-depth look. And we're not, you know, I'm not asking you to solve for anything. I'm just asking for filling in the energy bar chart. All right, if it's gone one third of the way, the, it, she, if she has gone one third of the way down the ramp, then she has some kinetic energy because she is moving. Uh, is she above the reference line? Yes. So she has some gravitational potential energy. What does she have more of? Well, she's only one third of the way down. I mean, she's still two thirds of the way up to her initial state. And so I think she has more gravitational potential energy. So we can fill those in like that. And if we look at the total, this bar, like 1.67 plus 1, 2, 3, 3.33. That still adds up to five, which is what this was. <coughs> All right. When she's most of the way down the ramp, only a teeny bit of gravitational potential energy. That's half a, got half a bar, like where this is one, two, three, four, five. And then four and a half of kinetic. So four and a half plus a half is still five, same as it was here and here. But 90% of the energy is now kinetic and only 10% of it is potential. All right, halfway up the other, I'm sorry, at the bottom of the ramp, this is where, well, it depends. Remember, it depends where we define the gravitational potential energy to be zero, but this could be, and already is actually by the way I've been doing it, we've defined it where the bottom of the ramp is where this is zero. So that means it's all kinetic energy at this point. The total of these three is still the same as the total was here, and the total was here, and the total was here. Halfway up the other side, equal amounts of each. At rest at the top of the other side is the same as when we started. Okay, so that gives you an idea of these energy bar charts, and you'll see them more in the note packets, and there'll be explanations to go along with those as well.